what we want to talk about is how to create the dynamics that work in our relationships that will cause us to be overcomers and not overcome. That we'll walk as victorious rather than as victims of another relationship that, that uh, went sour. Okay? So let's look at this. So here's the statement I made on social media. If you are fighting one another, you're fighting the wrong battle. See, the problem with a fight, and I, I've read a lot of different material, uh, and, and I've seen some things on television, you ought to fight fair. How about just not fighting at all? See, if we're fighting one another, we're fighting the wrong people. Husbands and wives and children and parents should not be fighting one another. Can I get some help in here? Okay, well, thank you, Jason. We shouldn't be fighting one another. Now, at home, in our home, in our home relationships is where we're supposed to be perfecting our faith and putting into practice the things that we're learning. Then we bring our families to church. Everybody say bring, not drop off. Bring our families to church. And here we get into put, put into practice in the family of God what we've been practicing at home. Then we take these relationships that we're perfecting at home, perfecting at church, we take it to the world, and we begin to put it into practice, these, these principles of successful relationships that know proper boundaries, we practice them in the marketplace where people don't believe the way we do all the time, and people don't love like we love at home all the time. Can I get a grunt? Because if we're not practicing this at home and proving that it works at home, what makes you think it's going to work out there in the world when people don't agree with you and people sometimes are mean, rude, hateful, cynical, and critical? So we can learn these things. Do you agree? Do you agree? So if we're fighting one another, we're fighting the wrong people. Church, if we're fighting each other, we're fighting the wrong people. If we're fighting other Christians, trying to straighten everybody out, we're doing the work of the Holy Spirit, and we are not supposed to be fighting other Christians in other churches just because they may have a, a doctrinal practice that's different than ours. We ought to be loving one another. By this shall all men know that you're my followers. Did he talk about denominations? No, he said disciples. By this shall all men know you're my followers, you're my disciples. So what would happen if Christians just all rallied together? You know what would happen if we all rallied together? all rallied together around the common Lord, one Lord, one baptism, one Jesus, one God, what would happen? We would change America. We have got to quit being pawns, pawns of the spirit of anti-Christ or anti-Christianity. We, we just got to stand up and, and believe the Bible and put it into practice, love people whether they like us or not, love people whether they pay us back or not, just love people. Now, love doesn't mean uh, becoming a doormat. So let's look at Mark chapter 10, verse 6. Uh, from the beginning of creation, everybody say creation. There is a clue. There's a clue right there. How did we get here? Creation. From the beginning of creation, God. Everybody say God. Two of the great truths in the world. There is a God. You're not it. So once we grasp this fact, if we can't get this simple fact here straight, the whole human experience gets a little warped. In the, from the beginning of creation, God made them. Everybody say, God made them. God made them. What did he make them? Male and what? God did that. God did that. How many of you know God knows what he's doing? A lot of people don't know what they're doing. God knows what he's doing. So here's the simple premise of human experience that, that lays the foundation for the human experience to, be, to live at the highest level of human potential. There is a God. I'm not it. God created us. He created us male and female. That, that is that's way more than what I'm going into now. Male and female. For this cause shall a man, everybody say man, leave his father. Everybody say father. That'd be a man. And his mother. Everybody say mother. That'd be a woman. Y'all still with me? Male and female. 
father, mother. This is God's simple plan. He made them this way. And he said to the man to leave his father man and his mother woe man and cleave to his wife woe man. Is everybody still with me? Now, is that our society? No. But the Word of God tells us the will of God. And we cannot change the Word of God just because society finds the Word of God to be an inconvenient truth. This is not derogatory toward anyone who believes there's a different pattern or a different style of living. That's not even a judgment. What I'm telling you is God's plan. Okay? You can live a different plan, but that doesn't make it the will of God. And if we don't believe God created us, then it basically opens it up to a free-for-all. Every man becomes God unto himself, or every woman becomes a God unto herself. All right, so let's keep going. And they twain, that's a woman, you know, Shania. Do y'all not read your Bible? Now, you lose that if you don't go with the King James right there. And they twain, those two, shall be what? One flesh. So then they are no more twain. Now, my grandfather worked 52 years for the Cotton Belt Railroad. Every day he went out on a twain, and every night he came home in a twain. That's what he did. That's, thank you. And they two shall be one flesh, so then the two who are two become one flesh. Now, in years past, many other lessons and, and sermons we've talked about, the problem is not that Janet and I become one flesh. The problems are when a husband and wife remain two minds. Now, whether or not we're going to go with the new rewriting of rules and guidelines of psychology or not, the reality is she has a woman brain because she's a woman. I have a man brain because I'm a man. And I process the world as a man. She processes the world and in, in her life experience as a woman. But that doesn't mean we still can't have the mind of Christ, even though with the two of us become one flesh. We can still have one mind. That's the mind of Christ. But she will process the mind of Christ as a woman. I'll process the mind of Christ as a man. And that brings value and completeness to us. I value her female perspective because I don't think like a woman. I don't even feel like a woman. But it says, a man shall leave his father, a man, and his mother, a woman, and shall cleave unto his wife, a woman. This word cleave in the New Testament here, in the Greek, in Mark chapter 10, the New Testament means he will cleave, be glued upon, glue to, join oneself closely, cleave to or stick to. That means Jesus and our relationship is our super glue. Amen. Come on. How many of you need some super glue in your relationship? You say, I don't need glue. I don't need to stick to them. I need some separation for a minute. Now, I, I want to be stuck to her. What's that song? I am stuck on band-aids because band-aids stuck on me. Ooh, the stuff that just runs through here in the anointing. How many of you have ever heard that? That's called a jingle. I am stuck on Janet because Janet stuck on me. Ta -da! Thank you, Pastor. That was wonderful. Thank you. All right, we're just going to have to be stuck here. And now, in the Old Testament, it says in Genesis chapter 2, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave unto his wife. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, it means to cling to, to keep close to, to stick to, to catch, to overtake, to pursue closely, to pursue for the rest of my life her, to be stuck on her. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? And look at the verse and say, isn't that good? And so we take a licking, and we keep on sticking. <laughs> Proverbs 18, 22 says, Whosoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing, and obtains favor of the Lord. How many of you believe in the favor of God? You, mean, you want to see the favor of God in my life? You want to see God's anointing and favor on my life as your pastor? Stand up, sweetie pie. Would you mind standing up? Look, there's the favor of God right there. That's the demonstration of the favor of God up on the man. <laughs> You see how when I said that, my voice got deep. Did you see that? Because I became a man. I'm a man, man. Favor of God right there. Everybody say favor. That's the favor of God. He that finds a wife finds a good thing. He that finds a bad wife finds a thing. Come on. 
Thank you. All right, let's keep going. Now, how many of you believe in the power of agreement? Jesus said, again, I say to you. Hey, so he's repeating himself. Why is he repeating himself? To fill pages? Because uh, the, he wanted the Bible to be thick? He repeated himself because he's about to pronounce something really important. Again, I say to you that if two of you shall agree on earth as to that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Deuteronomy 32.20, how shall one chase a thousand but two put ten thousand to flight? Maybe, maybe we could say it like this. Marriage is like a three-legged race. Y'all know when you, you, get a, uh, you tie your leg together and you have to walk in step? That's not really one flesh, but at least you're in unison and in unity. How can two walk together except they agree? The power of two becoming one. The power of two becoming one. Why is that important? Because individually I have power to put a thousand flights. She has power to put a thousand flights. Together we have the ability to put ten thousand to flight. Do you see the, the power of multiplicity? Do you see the power of what happens when we come together? So may I propose to you maybe that's why the world, the spirit of Antichrist is redefining marriage. Think about what the devil is up to by changing what God established and communicated through the pinning of the Holy Spirit that a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and those two become one. See, because if you redefine it, if you don't follow the will of God, you don't have the power of God, and though you may choose to love who you choose to love, when you break the word of God, I don't know about you, but I think the word sin still fits. Self-indulgent nonsense. And the devil, by a spirit of antichrist, institutes a new way. A new definition. If you want to walk at the highest level of human experience, you have to be willing to admit there's a way that seems right unto man, but the ways thereof are death. The end of sin is death. But... The ways of God are right. Let me just, be a, just make this simple. If you design the Ford, you don't go to the Chevy manual to understand the Ford. Some principles work, but you can't read page 38 in the Chevy manual and apply it to your Ford and expect to get a desired result, which is it's going to work right. When you have the Word of God, we have to recognize He created us. We're answerable to Him. And His ways are right. His ways are just. His ways are eternal. And we benefit both here and eternally if we do it His way. So if you grasp that, that He's God, we're not. No matter what your political persuasion, your race, your gender, He's God, we're not. In the beginning, he created male and female. And he said, a man shall leave his father, a man, and his mother, a woman, and shall cleave unto his wife, a woman, and they two become one complete person. Once you get that, you go, okay, well, I'm humble. I'll submit to that. Now, I've already, by doing that, acknowledged he's Lord, and I'm going to do things his way. And God says, I'm now going to pour out my spirit on you and empower you. Hi everybody, Perry Black right here at Arkansas Christian Academy. And I want to take this moment to just say thank you for looking at our website. I know you've got a lot of questions and they say a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, let me tell you, take a tour of Arkansas Christian Academy. That's worth a million words. Why don't you schedule a tour today, 501-847-0112. We look forward to hearing from you because spring registration is getting ready to open up. And in order to keep our classes small, maximum of 18 students per teacher or less, then we've got to know who's coming in the fall. And so we're getting ready to open up. 
And I look forward to hearing from you and meeting you, your family, your children, and watching them grow, not only in educational excellence, but character, integrity, and Christ-likeness. I look forward to seeing you again right here on our website, but more importantly, right here on our campus. Until then, I'll see you. God bless. So let's look at some common traits of happy couples. You know, you've heard me say this, people who work the word, the way the word works, see it work. When you do things at work, it works. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, that's so simple, it's silly. Happy couples feel comfortable together from the start. Happy couples felt comfortable from the start. A friend of mine named John is an underclassman. I'm a senior classman. He comes to my Algebra two class at Little Rock Central High School, and he's wearing a megaphone. That megaphone belonged to Janet Watson. She was a lionette at McClellan High School. And he comes in uh, wearing her megaphone. That means they're going steady. Well, one day, John, who's an underclassman, doesn't have an automobile. And he says, Perry, you know, when we were at Westside Junior High School, uh, Carol, our classmate, uh, has, uh, has made a friend at McClellan where she's now in high school. And uh, would you like to go over and see Carol? I said, well, yeah, that'd be fun. So John gets in my 57 Chevy, and we drive over to Fox Ridge, I think's the name of it, over in West Little Rock, off of Cantrell Avenue, to see Carol and his girlfriend, Janet. Soon as I walk in the house, Janet starts flirting with me. <laughs> John's got the megaphone, I got her attention. So we're flirting back and forth, and, and John's getting irritated, and Carol's getting irritated. Well, I didn't care. I'm getting flirted with. Now, I'm not, I'm not saved. I'm lost. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a, a member of Fellowship of Christian Athletes, but I'm not born again yet. But we're just immediately drawn to one another. Well, uh, that night I take John home, and, and uh, some time passes, and one day he walks into Algebra 2. He doesn't have on a megaphone. I say, hey, John, where's the megaphone? Oh, well. We broke up. Wrong. She broke up with him. How many of you know there's a difference? John, I just want you to know I love you, man. Uh, without you, it'd be somebody else on the front row, or maybe I'd still be going to hell. Who knows? Anyway, so time passes. Another little bit of period of time passes, and, and I recognize he's not wearing the megaphone. And my brother, Pat, who's uh, because we've relocated our home, I'm a senior, so I get to stay at Central. He's going to McClellan. Well, it just so happens as a 10th grader, she's a senior, they have art together. So Pat's kind of a quiet introvert like myself, and uh, <laughs> unlike myself. And every day in art, he, he says to Janet, hey, Perry says hi. She says, well, tell Perry hi. So he, he's using me to talk to her. Only thing he don't know, she's been flirting with me. So he's trying to, he's trying to do a little pickup on an older woman. And, but see, I don't, I don't know that. Because I'm just all about me. And so every day he comes home, Jan says hi. I said, tell Jan hi. Well, then closer to the end of the school year, he decides mom and dad are gone. So he, he says, Perry, why don't I call Janet? She can talk to Carol and Kathy, bring some girls over. I'm like, I'm down with my good self. Uh huh. So they come over. Well, as soon as she walks in the house, <laughs> compatibility. I start flirting with her. She starts flirting with me. I kiss her right on the mouth. I take her home. I think I kissed her on the mouth. I'm pretty sure you kissed me on the mouth. <laughs> and, I, and I take her home right over by Mabelville uh, Elementary School, over on Mabelville Cutoff. I take her home. And I come home, Pat's mad. See, I didn't know, probably didn't care. That he invited her. He'd been using me these hellos all this time. Well, that didn't work out too good. But like John Wayne, at the end of the, stop, at the, end of the movie, I got the girl. <laughs> now, I wasn't saved. I'm not even sure she was saved. But she's a good church-going girl. I believed in Jesus. I attended Oak, uh, Oak Forest Methodist Church when I lived at the Methodist home. I sang in the choir, did the handbells. I was a member of Fellowship and Christian Athletes. But neither of us were born again. We just good church-going young people. 
Well, off I'd go in the army, and any time I'd come home, her and my sister went to church together, and they'd pray for me. And then my mom gets in on the deal. If two of you agree it's touching anything in heaven, they start praying for me. The old agnostic atheist Perry just goofed up, messed up, and, and they're praying for me. And so if I came home, my sister, I'd say, can I borrow your car so I can take a girl out on a date? She said, yes. Two, two rules. Number one, you have to go to church with me and Janet in the morning, and you have to take Janet on the date. How'd that work out? So they're praying for me. In the spring of 1972, thanks to these women praying for me, I end up down front, long hair, marijuana embroidered on my shirt, a peace pouch, bell bottoms, and the whole thing. I'm down front blowing snot bubbles like a, like a sinner. And I, and I tell Brother Dwayne, <laughs> Brother Dwayne, I don't know if there's a God or a devil or a heaven or a hell. That's what I told him. You know what he said? Perry, we're going to pray for you. So now I got my mama praying for me. I got Janet praying for me. I got my sister Paula praying for me. Now I got the whole men's ministry of that church praying for me. You can clap if you want to. That's in March. In October, Jesus Christ comes flooding powerfully into my life and saved me. Hallelujah. Aren't you happy for Jesus? <laughs> but we were compatible compatible she used to send me when I was in Bad Kreuznach in the army I'd open my mail and she would send me dear pear that's what she called me because I'm a little fruity <laughs> on pear stationery Chanel number five and I'd open up dear pear sure miss you flirting with me Compatible from the moment we met. Still compatible. Happy couples. Happy couples feel compatible. Ladies, look up here. You, you have got to understand point number two is happy couples share compatible dreams and goals and values. If the man in your life that you're not married to, the man in your life that, that you're praying for, if, he's not, if he doesn't share your values, he doesn't share your dreams and your goals, why are you dating him? Sit down with a piece of paper or with an iPad and write down what you're believing God for and become the woman that that guy that you're believing God for is looking for. And watch what God will do. But I'm telling you, if you just say, how many of you believe you can name things? You can call things that be not as though they were. You can call into your life things that are not in your life right now. If he's a jerk, what makes you think you're going to change him just because he gives you a wedding ring? You either ask God for what you want or settle for what you can get. Ladies, gentlemen, do not settle. Thank you. All right, don't settle. What do you believe in God for? Happy couples adapt and change. You know, God's still working on me. Is he still working on you? And he's put someone in my life that I can trust to help me become more, better, gooder. <laughs> to help me become more of what she's believing God for. Now, I will never be able to meet all of her needs, but I am the one human man that God has put in her life to, on a daily basis. And so, I've got to be humble enough to be willing to change when she speaks into my life something about me that needs to change or adapt. Well, I'll tell you right now, brother, I ain't changing for no woman. Okay, you need to change that or I'm not going to change for any women because it's going to be women in your life, not woman in your life. March 30th, we will celebrate 45 years of happy, fulfilling marriage. That's awesome. Do you understand how awesome that is? That's not by accident. It's because I, everybody say I, have been willing to change and adapt. My way is not always the way. How about this? Happy couples look for the best in one another. Why? Because it's easy to see the flaws in each other. Don't you? I can see your flaws. I hear your flaws. I read your flaws on social media. Don't you know mine? Don't you see mine? Don't you hear mine? Do you look for the best in one another? Are you willing to change when 
you've opened your heart to someone and they help you see some things that are lifestyle patterns that are not conducive to healthy relationships. Happy couples describe their mate as their best friend. That's, I've told you many times, she's my best friend. I make no bones about that. If I'm going to spend five hours a day doing something, I'd rather do it with her than any man in this room. That's why I don't play golf. That's why I haven't played golf in over seven years. Driving down the road, pull up to a signal light that happens to be red, I can kiss her. But I promise you, you get me in a golf cart, guys, I ain't kissing you. And if you kiss me, I'm going to give you a new definition of the word ping golf clubs. I'm going to ping you right upside the head. <laughs> Happy couples do not fight for the upper hand, but rather a win-win solution. Happy couples, here's the problem when we fight to win. My way, bless God, I'm a man. When you win, somebody else lost. Guys, when you fight, well, I'm a man, bless God, you're supposed to submit to me. When you fight to win, your wife loses. And I'm telling you, when your wife loses, it makes the full circle. So do you. You cannot be the man of God that, you, that you've been called to be if you create a loser of your wife. So what do we do? We talk, we communicate, we change, we adapt. And sometimes we don't compromise our faith, our values, our goals, our dreams, or the Word of God. But sometimes we compromise so both of us win. Happy couples don't fight for the upper hand. Number seven, happy couples understand the importance of cultivating intimacy. If you don't understand the previous six, you'll never have true intimacy. And in my mind, and in my definition, intimacy is where you don't know the other ends and you begin. You're so interwoven together, so intimate together, you cannot function properly as a whole person without one another. I cannot fathom what it's like to live my life without her. I'm telling you, one of the most frustrating days of my month is the fourth Sunday of every month between 5.30 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. Ladies Fellowship. I have to be alone for three stinking hours without my wife while y'all are fellowshipping. So you know what I do? I put on my gun and I come up here and work security. Hi, this is Perry Black, and I want to let all of our viewers know that all of my messages are free, and you can download those at FamilyChurchBryant.org, and I'll see you next week right here on VTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection.